afternoon and welcome and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to our stellar students that are engaged in our private academy here, our unique elite of private academy. And thank you for the many neighbors across the miles of Tucson uh, for joining us this afternoon. We will be here for um, maybe about an hour and 15 minutes um, to hear from Dr. Will Tuttle, uh, who is the author of The World Peace Diet. He is an international speaker, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention also his remarkable wife, Madeline, who has been an artist her entire life, and you will be able to see some of the great work that she has done. And I will tell you that Robin Matzer is the one who introduced me to Will, and uh, Robin is somebody who is my comadre, that we hike and tear down mountains together, and in that process we change the world every time. Um, and anyway, thank you for your friendship, years of friendship. <laughs> Um, so I had not heard of the World Peace Diet until Robin brought Will Tuttle and Madeline into my life here about a year ago. And it was then that I got a hold of his audiobook and his book, and Veg Delight? Veg Daily Veg Inspirations. Daily Veg Inspirations. Thank you, Matea. And it absolutely transformed my life, and I've been the last few days been writing down some adjectives of what that experience was like in hearing your voice through the reading of the book. It was gripping, it was moving, it was awakening, it was heartbreaking, and it was heart-making. It was enlightening, informing, and many more remarkable things. And it was after that that I also became vegan when I understood the consequences, the unintended, con unimaginable consequences of my actions. So here's Robin to introduce Will. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Pamela, and everyone here at Amity Circle Tree Ranch. We're glad to be back at Bear Hall with Will Tuttle and Madeline Tuttle. And just a brief introduction of, of Will. So Will is an educator, composer, pianist, and writer. He's the author of the international bestseller, The World Peace Diet, published in 16 languages. They travel all over the world, even China, right? It's amazing. The peace activist and vegan for 40 years, recipient of the Courage of Conscience Award and Empty Cages Award, creator of the World Peace Diet Training Programs. He's a PhD from UC Berkeley, focusing on educating intuition and altruism. Uh, we need a lot more of that in this world. And he taught college courses in philosophy, humanities, mythology, and comparative religion. He's also a former Zen monk and Dharma master in the Korean Zen tradition. He's also the co-founder of the Worldwide Prayer Circle for Animals. And currently, he's conducting a music, art, and education ministry with his spouse, Madeline, a visionary artist from Switzerland is specializing in painting that celebrates the beauty of animals in nature. Madeline is also a flutist, flautist, Waldorf teacher, vegan cook and coach, and organic gardener. So thank you so much for being here, Will and Madeline, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Health is one of the main reasons people either do not want to change their diet, they're afraid if they don't eat meat and dairy products, they won't get enough protein, they won't get enough calcium, so they keep eating meat and dairy products and eggs and so forth for health reasons. However, lots of people abandon eating meat and dairy products for health reasons too, which I think is actually a smart idea. 
And so the basic idea I'd like to talk about, though, is health at a bigger uh, picture, including not just our physical health, which is what we usually think of when we think of health, but including environmental health, cultural health, as well as our psychological health and our spiritual health. So the basic idea, one of the main ideas, is that animal agriculture is harmful to our health. The underlying idea, really, in this whole message is very positive. The basic positive message is that all of us, as human beings, have been given a wonderful gift. We've been given the gift of a physical body that does not require any animals to suffer, to be imprisoned, to be killed, and so forth. Um, to get all the nutrients that we need to be healthy and to thrive, to celebrate our lives here. That's the basic thing. We have been given this wonderful gift. The thing is, of course, what happened to me and what's happened to most of us, is that we're born into a culture where from the time we're little infants, that gift is denied, right? As little kids, we're eating, like I was, I was eating meat, dairy products, and eggs because my mother wanted to make sure I was getting plenty to, of protein. And plus, this is what they ate, right? My parents ate that because their parents ate that because their parents ate that. You know, it kind of goes back to the generations. But the good news is that's all unnecessary. Madeline and I live, have lived actually uh, in an RV traveling all over North America for 17 years. We've been everywhere, I mean, every state, we've seen a lot. And basically, it's very clear to us that animal agriculture is devastating to the environmental, uh, environmental health. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about environmental health, cultural health, and our physical health. That's the outer dimensions of health that we should be aware of. And the basic idea is these white lines show, these all intersect with each other. They all uh, uh, interact with each other, in other words, it's hard for me to be physically healthy if the environment is not healthy, right? If the water's polluted, if the air is polluted, if the soil is eroded, if the foods I'm eating have lots of pesticide, herbicide, and fungicide residues, right? So the whole idea is to just understand that animal agriculture is the number one most devastating activity that human beings engage in in terms of harming our outer environment. Uh, it's, it's causing soil erosion, water depletion, water pollution, uh, global climate destabilization, deforestation, ocean destruction, uh, really every, virtually every problem we're having, it's the number one primary cause. So if you just care about the environment a little bit, the greatest gift you can give actually to reduce your environmental footprint is to move to a plant-based way of eating because that is the way we can most powerfully help heal the earth. According to the National Academy of Sciences, which is very conservative, they estimate between 10 and 15 uh, times. In other words, you can feed 10 to 15 people eating a plant-based diet on the amount of land it takes to feed one person eating the standard, typical Western diet. So because the, we're, most of the grain we're growing, like the corn and soy, uh, alfalfa, these are genetically engineered and they're fed to these imprisoned cows and pigs and chickens. Factory farmed fishes eat huge amounts of grain. So it's very wasteful, and all the, the sewage and so forth, and the nitrous oxide and methane that come from this are devastating. There's huge dead zones in the ocean. The oceans uh, uh, are being depleted of fish to feed, not just us, but to feed the cows and pigs and chickens. Most people don't realize that cows, for example, eat huge amounts of fish because scientists discovered that if you enrich the feed, they give more milk. So if I'm drinking milk or eating cheese, I'm actually eating fish in most cases. So, all, but the toxins always concentrate in these foods. So the heavy metals and PCBs and dioxins, nuclear radiation, it all ends up in fish, it ends up in cows and pigs and chickens. So all of these end up in our bodies. That's why we want to have a healthy environment, but animal agriculture destroys the health of the environment because it's so wasteful. And then in terms of cultural health, it's the same thing. Since we, want, we, we not only want to live in a healthy, um, beautiful earth. How many of you have noticed by now that the earth is beautiful? Anybody notice that yet? <laughs> the earth is so beautiful. You know, Mel and I being here in Tucson, we're just, uh, it's so gorgeous to see the, the precious landscape. It's very kind of uh, fragile here in a sense and even more beautiful, I think. But the idea is to understand that the earth is not only beautiful, the earth is also abundant. We're right now growing enough food every year to feed everyone. No one who studies the world hunger problem argues this, right? We all know that we're growing, according to experts, between 10 and 15 billion people can be fed the amount of food we're growing. Some people say even 20 billion. We have about 7.7 .7 billion. So there's no reason 
for anyone to be hungry when we're growing enough food, right, to feed 10 to 15 billion people. But we have almost a billion of our brothers and sisters are chronically hungry and starving. Why is it? I just explained why. Because most of the grain we're growing, instead of feeding it to people, especially hungry people, we're feeding it to imprisoned cows and pigs and chickens and eating their flesh. It's extremely inefficient and wasteful of resources, of water, of land, of petroleum. And so <clears throat> these people are starving. So we have a lot of problems with, with hunger and starvation in the world. And anyone who studies this whole thing understands that that's the driving force behind conflict in the world, is injustice and inequality. When you have a mother who sees her babies, babies um, you know, starving, and not far away there are people eating huge amounts of grain by eating meat and dairy and eggs while their kids starve, you're, you're going to have war and conflict. And uh, so the, that's one of the main reasons it's important, I think, to think about not only having healthy ecosystems, to think about indigenous people who are being, being driven off their land to grow grain, to feed you know, or, you know, or to graze animals. This is happening all over the world. Uh, but also hungry people are, are starving because those of us who live in the, in the industrialized nations of the world, we have high-powered economies and it's not difficult for us to drive up the price of grain on the world market and feed it to our cows and pigs and chickens. But people who live in less industrialized nations, they can't afford it, so they're, they're going hungry while we eat, we eat their grain, basically. And the other thing to remember is that there are whole teams of people, armies of people, unfortunately, who do the work of killing animals and imprisoning them, impregnating them against their will on what the industry refers to as rape racks. And these workers do terrible work. I mean, they do work that no one wants to do. Madeline and I have actually visited stockyards and slaughterhouses and these places. And it's heartbreaking to see what the animals go through, the terrible violence that they endure. But think of the people who have to stab animals all day or do this. These workers have the highest rates of injuries, among the highest rates of suicide, drug addiction, alcoholism, spousal abuse. They're, they're just engaging in, in violence and in work that brings out the worst in them. So again, if we care about people, right, about hungry people or future generations or slaughterhouse workers, um, moving to a plant-based diet is a way we can bless uh, the world, right? We can bless hungry people. We save, according to um, scientists who study this, this moving to a plant-based diet saves over 100 trees a year. So we're saving over 100 trees just by moving to a plant-based diet because we're cutting down so many forests to grow the grain that, that, are, that is making the burgers at McDonald's and Burger King. So that's, and then the physical health, that's something I'd like to talk a little bit about also because the neat thing about physical health, a lot of people move toward a plant-based way of eating because they want to be healthier. And some people say, well, you know, it's more uh, noble to move to a plant-based way of, of eating because it's better for the animals, it's better for you know, hungry people and so forth. Um, but, if, if, but if I just only want to be healthy myself, some people think that's kind of selfish, but that's not selfish. That's very good, <laughs> right? People who are healthy um, are, are make life better for everyone around us, right? It's really important to remember that. Like, if we take responsibility for our physical health, we make life better for everyone. And uh, we've seen this a number of times, like we'll be giving a lecture somewhere and we, we meet people, we come back a few years later. I remember this is like a, a woman in Fort Myers who read the World Peace Diet, she went vegan, and, um, and, but her husband, you know, he just liked his bacon and he didn't want to do it, you know? So the years went by and she kept eating vegan food, but he just wouldn't do it. And then and after a few years, he had a, a stroke. And then, you know, from all that saturated fat and cholesterol, and then she had to take care of him. And after a few years, he didn't even remember who she was. He had to, she had to take care of him for about eight more years until he died. But um, the whole idea is that it was, it was hard on her too, right? Because he didn't want to change. So again, to, when we have compassion and kindness for animals, for ecosystems, for hungry people, for workers, for the people around us, we move to our plant-based way of eating, it's better for everyone because we have more health. Why is a plant-based way of eating healthier? So I'll, I'll address that a little bit. The basic reason a plant-based way of eating is healthier is um, that this, this is the food that we're designed to eat. We're designed basically to eat plant-based foods. We're not designed to eat meat. We're definitely not designed to eat dairy products, right? There's one way actually you can tell if you're a person who really would thrive on dairy products. And this is the way to tell. After the um, lecture is over, you know, go back, go back home, go back to, you know, to where you live and go into the bathroom 
and turn on the light and just look in the mirror. And if you see a little calf looking back at you, then you're one of those people who should be eating dairy products. <laughs> but if you, don't see a, if you see a human being, then really, I mean, honestly, I, know, I ate huge amounts of dairy growing up. And I had appendicitis, and my brother always had you know, sore throats and runny nose, noses and tonsillitis and all these things. I mean, it fills up the hospital. It's great for the pharmaceutical medical industry. You dairy, you'll make, you're guaranteed to make some pharmaceutical people very wealthy, and they'll love you for that. You know, they'll be really happy. <laughs> but if you just want to be healthy, you know, stay far away from dairy products. We do not have renin in our system. Renin is an enzyme that little calves have that breaks down casein. Casein is the main protein in milk. We don't have it. So not only are many people lactose intolerant, but everyone is casein intolerant. Casein is a protein we, we really have a hard time breaking down, so it causes a lot of autoimmune diseases, a lot of liver disease, kidney disease, uh, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, type, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancers. I mean, dairy, really. So we're not designed for sure to eat dairy products. It's, I could go on and on. I mean, I could talk at least at two hours on dairy, but I won't. But, um, but even meat itself, because again, anytime you're eating the flesh of an animal, you're eating toxins, right? There's a, they, they all concentrate toxins in their food. So any pesticide that they've been drinking or breathing or eating, it concentrates in the fat of animal flesh. So um, to move, to eat lower on the food chain, to eat grains, not seeds, legumes. These are the foods that, that were actually designed and they're very clean burning. In other words, when I'm, like, when I'm you know, waving my arms around here, right? it takes energy to do that. Where, where do we get the energy that we run this body in? It comes from, basically, from carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates. They burn clean to car carbohydrate, carbon dioxide, and water. That's it. They're very clean. As soon as I'm eating protein, it creates acid. And the, and the hospitals are filled up with people that are there because of a lot of acid. Who have, uh, again, the diseases that we were talking about, a lot of cancer, heart disease, liver disease. Um, arthritis and dementia, all these things come from an acidified system. So eating a plant-based diet, lots of vegetables, grains, beans, uh, nuts, fruits, seeds. These foods are easy for us to digest. They have lots of fiber, which we really need to be healthy. And the other thing is protein. Animal-based protein is much lower quality than plant-based protein. Plant-based protein has all the amino acids that we need to be healthy. There's 20 amino acids that are combined, like letters in an alphabet. Our body makes over a million different proteins that, uh, for all kinds of different things. And so it's the best for our body to just take those proteins from plants, because it, it's simple. If, you, if we're using animal foods for protein, the animal has already built these large proteins and has to break them down. That's why it creates all this acid. So eating plants is much higher quality. That's why, how many of you, have you heard of this new film called The Game Changers? You've seen, yeah, okay, good. So I don't have to explain it to you. And this, this shows like some of the, the strongest people on the planet, the fastest runners on the planet. They're all vegans because it's just much healthier. I, I mean, I've been 40 years a vegan and it's, I've stayed out of the health care system for 40 years. I haven't had you know, health insurance, I haven't gone to the doctor. You know, it's, I'm not the only one. I mean, I don't, I'm not, nothing to be proud of, but just to say that if you, if you just want to be healthy, you know, and stay out of going to the drugstores and having pharmaceutical stuff, all that, we're designed to be healthy, right? If we're, if we're eating healthy food, if we're th thinking healthy thoughts and, and, and doing the best we can to be loving and kind, then this is a vegan life, right? We're, veganism is love. It's basically love, not just theoretically, but actually practically, you know, how I'm actually living, you know, being kind and loving, especially to those who are vulnerable. Animals, you know, they're, they're, they're the lowest, um, most unprotected, they're like the lowest status beings, even though they suffer. How many of you have had a companion animal at some time, like a dog or a cat, some of you, yeah. So you know, when you look at the dog or a cat, there's someone in there, right? There's a being in there, and they have interests. They don't, they don't want to be locked in a closet, and they don't want to be sold by the pound. If someone came by and said, well, I'm going to eat your dog, uh, how about $10 a pound? You say, no, 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 <laughs> you're not going to do that. I love my dog, and my dog is not just a piece of meat. But we do that to cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys and ducks and you know, all these lambs and goats and these other animals. And they're just the same, right? They're, their interests are to them as important as my interests are to me. But we as a society say their interests don't matter. And that's violence and oppression and exploitation that we commit on billions of beings. And we don't just commit it. We don't, when we commit it, when we take out our wallets and pay for it, right? That's 
when it happens. I'm telling someone, go stab an animal I, I, and sell it by the pound. And that's the violence, but then we don't just stop there. Then we turn around, we actually eat that violence. We, you know, we actually eat this, we feed it to our children, we teach them to do the same thing. So no one means to be bad. It's just that the system is set up this way. The system is set up to exploit and oppress beings who don't have uh, rights or don't have their interests protected. So what we're talking about essentially is just to try to open our hearts and have some kind of kindness, compassion, and respect for other expressions of life. And the beautiful thing is when we do that, we find that we get much happier, we have more inner peace, we have more health, we have more joy and freedom and liberation and creativity flowing through us because now our cells are being fed by love and joy and, and something that's uh, a celebration of life like vegetables and grains and nuts and seeds rather than terror and fear and pain and despair and anxiety and misery. I mean, why would I want to put that into this body that's really a temple of the spirit. I mean, this is where, this is our one chance. We get a body here, you know, we should take care of it, right? And, and use it. So, so that's basically the physical, the psychological and spiritual health. These are the inner dimensions. And uh, just briefly, I just want to mention that the, the basic idea is that every time we're eating animal foods, we're eating attitudes. This is something that uh, we're not really taught, but um, you know, my PhD at Berkeley was in education, and one of the interesting things is that anthropologists understand that every society transmits its values from generation to generation through the rituals of that society. That's what societies do. And the main ritual in every society are meals. When we're sitting down at the table, we're eating food. We're not just eating food. We're eating a whole set of attitudes, a whole story about our relationship with nature and animals and each other. And so we have to understand that this, um, this story we're eating and the attitude, attitudes we're eating are not in our best interest. They're attitudes of domination, and exploitation, of disconnectedness. I'll talk more about this maybe later. But just to understand that the food is actually not in our best interest. It's pretty toxic. It makes the, the hospitals are filled up with people eating the standard American diet. The arteries are getting clogged up. Our cells are full of all kinds of diseases, obesity, diabetes, all these problems. But the attitudes, it reduces our intelligence, it reduces our sensitivity. I'll explain that more later. And then the spiritual dimension is maybe the most important of all, because this has to do with living a life of purpose. Living, you know, being here on this earth, we're just here for a few years, you know, a few precious years. It goes by very quickly. I can say already, I'm in my late 60s, I think, oh, where, did, where did my life go? It goes by very fast. <laughs> I remember reading an interview with the oldest living person not too long ago, she's apparently like 118 years old. And they said, what's it like to be 118 years old? And she thought for a minute and then she said, all I can say is, it went by really fast. <laughs> it goes by fast. So let's take time every day to think about our life and think about our purpose. You know, what, what is it that we'd like to do with this life, this precious life that we have? Because the problem with animal agriculture, it's based at its core around stealing the purposes of other beings. You know, cows and pigs and chickens, they're just, think of it, they're born into jail. They're born into prison. They're born into misery and violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse, mutilations, and then killed in a horrible way, alone and terrified and being tortured. That's what we do to billions of beings and we eat that. We steal their purpose and we don't, and we don't talk about it. We pretend as a whole society that this is normal. And in, in, in this violence, it reverberates everywhere. So the whole idea is not to blame anyone, just to realize this is something that's, you know, we're born into. It's, it's a wound, we've been wounded. But the beautiful thing is we can heal that, right? We can heal ourselves and we can help heal our society by awakening, awakening out of the, the, the behavior and the trance, basically, of eating animal foods. It's not easy because food is tribal. You know, it's like we're born into a tribe, and this is our tribe. And if, if anyone questions the tribal food, it's like, no, 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 don't do that. You're not part of the tribe anymore. So it's difficult, actually. You know, that's the hardest thing. The hardest thing about veganism is not veganism, it's other people. You know, what they, <laughs> what they think about it, you know? Because they're like, well, you're not part of the tribe. That's the deep, very deep, sort of unspoken, unconscious dimension. But the good news, again, is as Madeline and I have been traveling all over the world, we see that the tribe is growing. There's a whole, like this, like this vegan tribe is getting bigger and bigger. And that makes it much easier because it's a tribe really based on kindness and respect for all expressions of life. So that's, those are all interconnected and we can maybe talk more about that. But um, 
I want to talk a little just briefly about the history of this. Herderism is a word I coined, which is the core of our society, which is owning animals as property for food. That's herding, right? Herding. But herding animals is the essence of our society. It's the core behavior, and it reduces animals to mere uh, commodities that are bought and sold by the pound, like rocks or cement. This is the big, this is the big problem, because when you reduce the being in slavery, and it led to uh, a lot of other things like a wealthy elite class. There had never been a wealthy elite class on planet Earth until people started owning animals as property for food. And gradually, over the th this started in what is today Iraq about 10,000 years ago. For the first time, people started owning wild sheep, and then wild goats, and then wild cows, and then other animals. So animals were reduced to being mere, mere property gradually. The other wild animals were reduced to being pests. Right? You want to get rid of the coyotes and the bobcats and the mountain lions and the prairie dogs. And, you know, kill them all off because they might interfere with my property. So there's this whole violence against ecosystems and owning of nature came out of this. And then a wealthy elite class emerged, and these were the kings. They were wealthy and powerful because they owned the most livestock. If you could read the oldest books, I used to teach college courses on these ancient books, like the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Iliad, the Odyssey, these ancient books. There's these kings, right? What are they doing? Well, they're dominating their society, and they're wealthy and powerful because they have capital. Capita is an old Latin word that means um, head, as in head of sheep and goats. And uh, so the more capital you had, the more goats and sheep you owned, the wealthier you were. And then they uh, invented another institution that we still have with us, which is war. There had never been war. But once you own, have animal agriculture and you have this wealthy elite that wants to get rich, they see another king with livestock and they say, let's go get that. And so they they, they have a big fight over it because it, you need a lot of land, you need a lot of water for, the, for your livestock. And so that led war. The, the oldest word for war on planet Earth is the ancient word gavya from the Sanskrit language. It means literally the desire for more cows. That's the first word for war. And then that led directly to slavery because whoever lost the war, not only did the animals become the property of the victors, but the people became the property of the victors. So this whole idea of looking at another being like I own you, like I can do whatever I want with you because you're just property. I can, I can sexually abuse you, I can kill you, I can do anything because you're property. This started with animal agriculture. This is the most violent, hideous thing. These, two, these are the two most violent, hideous, devastating effects, the most demonic things in our society are war and slavery, and they both come directly from animal agriculture. Their natural following. We have to understand, like I was raised thinking and taught that, you know, that ranching and farming of animals is some kind of good thing. You know, this is what made how the West was won, how that made our country great, and you know, all this stuff. To realize, no, this is the most violent, devastating thing. If, we, if I had been born as a cow or a pig, I would, I would understand that. But since I'm born as a human being, you know, we're the superior ones. But it's very, it's very harmful. So um, that led to the domination of the feminine because basically animal agriculture, people think animal agriculture is humans dominating animals. And that's true. But what it really is is men dominating female animals. That's what it really is. It's men dominating and sexually abusing female animals. That's the core of animal agriculture. You cannot have animal agriculture without these three things. It's, you've got to confine them, right? imprison them which is the worst thing you can do to a wild, free, living animal. They love to be free, they love to run around. I mean, if a, if a fox or a coyote gets caught in a trap, what do they do? They bite, they chew their own foot off to get free. And that's how much they want to be free. So we're, we, we imprison these animals from birth, which is no free people would ever do that. We're already slaves. We're slaves if we would have animals be born as slaves, really, in our society. Um, but we not only that, then we kill them. But the whole thing depends on breeding. The whole thing depends on impregnating her against her will so she's just a breeder and then stealing her babies over and over again. So the female gradually in a herding culture is seen merely as a breeder just to give me what I want if I'm a man. So this, this is the underlying thing that we're eating every day and feeding to our children. So we have to understand that now, this is not something that's healthy for us as a society to have a whole culture based on the domination and exploitation of animals and of the female, of the sacred feminine dimension of life. And then finally, it's harmful to boys also because boys have a natural kindness and natural sensitivity and, and caring and love that has to be suppressed. No, you have to be hard and tough and be able to 
uh, fight and kill other rival herders and dominate women and so forth. So it wounds all of us. Men and women are all wounded by this. And it, it basically lays waste our world. And we find that we have uh, a system that in many ways uh, is very harmful. That sort of shows that. But the good news is that I'm not here just to um, criticize a system that's devastating. This is, this is the alternative. <clears throat> a vegan world basically is available to us. There's nothing stopping us essentially from moving to a plant-based way of eating. The food is delicious. I mean, I, I've been doing it for 40 years and I'm not the only one. There's literally millions of people who are also doing this. Uh, of course, they're not all married to Madeline, so they don't have the best, <laughs> such great food I have. <laughs> but, uh, but the basic idea is we have, uh, if you can read this, abundance, healthier ecosystems, healthier economies, healthier people, more freedom, justice, and equality, more harmony, peace. And this is natural. This is something that all of us can contribute to every day by our actions. A vegan living is based on ahimsa, which is an old Sanskrit word that means non-harmfulness. The basic idea is to just wake up in the morning and think, I'll try to do the best I can not to harm or abuse other people, <laughs> other, other beings. The animals are also people, actually, uh, when we understand them. So to be, to be kind and loving to others. And then L-O-W-F-P-V, that basically is just short for a local, organic, whole food, plant-based way of living. In other words, uh, being you know, vegan or plant-based, uh, whole foods is important because if, as soon as we eat foods from a factory, very often there's all kinds of chemicals or, or additives or preservatives. So to try to buy foods in their natural state as much as possible, organic is helpful be, and important because if it's not organic, then we're using pesticides and herbicides and fungicides that end up in the water and are killing birds and fish and insects right now are being really wiped out. And it ends up in our bodies, which ca causing a lot of problems actually to our digestive system, cancer, nervous system problems. So, an or and local is good as much, as much as we can to support local farmers. So that's, the good, so that's the good news. The good news is that that's available. And the thing to remember, this is kind of a, just a little <laughs> summary of the whole thing. Uh, it says at the top, nobody wants to acknowledge the cow in the room which is animal agriculture. And then you have people saying, diabetes rates have doubled, there are dead zones in the ocean, the rainforests are disappearing, I'm worried about the next pandemic, why is our society so violent, global warming is unstoppable, you know, my doctor needs angioplasty, 800 million people are starving, California is running out of water, one single industry causes so much harm. That kind of summarizes what I've been saying, uh, you know, just on a surface level, but I, I've been going much deeper into it so you understand. But that's the good news is that um, we don't need animal agriculture. I mean, nobody needs it. It's actually a totally obsolete idea. Maybe for some reason, 10,000 years ago, uh, people in uh, Iraq thought that they needed to eat animal foods for some reason, need to imprison cows and pigs and chickens and, and, and eat them. But we can see clearly today it's not necessary. We don't need to do that. We could all eat plant-based foods to be much healthier. And we could allow rivers to heal and oceans to heal. And we could allow uh, the prairies uh, to come back, the forests to come back, the climate to, you know, be, would be better off. The, just in general, the pollution level would just radically drop because we, we, it would just be a much smaller footprint. And our physical health, our, our psychological health, our spiritual health would have a chance to heal and become much better also. So I'd like to um, just play a short piece of music and invite you as you're listening to let the music maybe just take you on an inner journey. This is called Dance for the Arctic Moon is the title. The moon represents, in many cultures, the feminine dimension of consciousness. And also in some cultures, it represents spiritual awakening. And the north of the four directions, the north is usually the direction of inner silence, of, of going within, of inner listening, just kind of listening within to get in touch with our inner wisdom, our intuition. So this is Dance for the Arctic Moon, and um, it's dedicated really to creating a world of peace and freedom and health and joy and abundance for everyone. Enjoy, thank you.
Thank you for the piano. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, um, okay. So, the uh, what do I say after that? You know. <laughs> but the uh, the beautiful thing I think really is that you know, all of us can connect with our own inner wisdom and questions the the messages that come that are not in our best interest. And when we do that, we create a field, I think, of healing within our own body, within our own mind, but also we can help others around us. So the basic idea is to look at the power of community. And the basic thing is, like, when we leave here, we see people going to the restaurant or going somewhere and taking out their wallets and paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs. There's only one reason anyone does that. The one reason anyone does that is that they're following orders, right? I was given these orders from the, from the time I was a little kid by my mother, by my father, by my the, the teachers, by the minister at the church, by the ads on TV, by all my friends and neighbors and relatives. You need to eat these foods. Go to any grocery store and look at the baby food section. You'll see little, you'll see, you'll see jars of bananas and things, but you'll also see veal and turkey and chicken and beef. You know, it's all in there. So we're eating these foods and we, we trust it, our, our parents and adults around us completely. So the power of community, the only reason eat, anyone eats animal foods is because of the communities we're raised in. For example, when I was a kid, I remember I, we had, I had lots of meat, dairy products and eggs. This was back in the 1950s in Massachusetts, Concord, Massachusetts. And I remember when I was about seven, I, I asked my mother, I said, Mom, the kind of foods we're eating, is this what everybody eats? She said, you mean everybody in the whole world? And I said, yeah, like, yeah, it's everybody eat like we're eating. And she thought for a minute and she said, yeah, more, I think more or less they, they eat like we do. And, uh, then, and then she kind of left and then she came back and she said, you know what, that's not totally true because there are vegetarians. And I was at that age when I liked learning new words and I liked especially learning kind of long words and I, I was like, what's this vegetarian? You know, I said, what's a vegetarian? And she thought for a minute and she said, a vegetarian is, um, well, you know, don't worry about it. You're never going to meet one. <laughs> so ironic. But anyway, she said, <laughs> and, then, um, and then she said, I don't know where they get their protein. You know? So for me at seven years old, I thought, wow, I mean, these vegetarians, they're extremely rare because I knew my mother was very, very old and she hadn't even met one. I thought, wow. They're, and not only that, but um, they didn't get enough protein. So I had this image in my mind of these these terrible, poor people that were kind of dragging themselves, crawling through the dirt, begging for protein, you know, like, oh, I was so glad I was not a vegetarian. It sounded like the worst thing would be a vegetarian. And so my mother was totally right, and I went on living my life, and he never heard the word again, you know, and she, that was it, and uh, eating the usual meals and lots of meat, dairy products, and eggs. I remember going away when I was about 13 years old for a few years in the summer with my younger brother, Ed. We went away to the summer camp in Vermont every year, and Vermont is, you know, kind of famous for these little cute little farms nestled in the green mountains, and this had a little farm there, and we would learn to do these different farming things in the summer. And one, of the th and one of the things I learned was to catch a chicken, right? Catch my chicken, hold her down with my left hand, have my axe in my right hand, you know, cut her head off, put her through the scalding tank. We would eat the chickens. At 13 years old, I didn't, I didn't like, I really, I didn't, I, I didn't like doing it, but I had no problem doing it because I knew I was doing the right thing. I knew God, I, you know, by that time, I'd gone through 13 years of the most intense indoctrination a human being can possibly go through, three times a day. And if I didn't eat them, I would definitely die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency. And that's the whole, that was the whole thing. So, so it wasn't yeah, difficult for me. It was like 13 years old, I'm old enough, I can do what a man needs to do and that kind of thing. And the other thing though that was interesting, I still remember very clearly, was that every year we would also gather around one of the dairy cows. They had some dairy cows there. And every year we would do this thing where we'd put a gun to the head of the dairy cow, we'd pull the trigger, you know, it was like, much more disturbing because this wasn't just a small animal. This is a 2,000 pound animal with huge amounts of blood and urine and feces and everything like pouring everywhere. And, and so I saw, I participated in killing these animals, um, but I never thought it was wrong. You know, I, I, never, I, th I thought you have to, you, if we don't get, and the guy said, if we don't use the cow for milk, you know, I mean, we can't use it to get milk money, we have to get meat money, you know. That's, that was their purpose. Their purpose was just to give us money and to give us uh, what we need to eat and so forth. And so, 
so that's the, the situation I was in. I was eating lots of animal foods. I, I even killed cows and chickens and other animals uh, as part of that because I, that was what we did. But I am so glad that when I went, I actually went away to college in Maine in the early 1970s and um, I, I didn't change. I, I heard that there were some vegetarians on campus, but I never met one. My mother, like my mother said, you'll never meet one. <laughs> I heard there were sort of a, a few around somewhere. But then, right after college, my brother and I decided we wanted to go on a spiritual pilgrimage. We wanted, before we went into working and all that stuff, we thought, take it. so we were gonna walk, we decided we would walk across uh, the country to California. So that was our idea. So we, we left and we, we started walking. And we got as far as Buffalo. <laughs> and in Buffalo, it was like October, it was freezing. And I thought, well, let's just head south. So we actually headed, we walked south for quite a few months down through upstate New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, into Tennessee. And when we got to Tennessee, um, we stopped for a few weeks at a community. So this is the key, community. This was a community called The Farm which I had heard of, but I had never visited. But anyways, the farm at that, in 1975 was the largest hippie commune in the world. There was about uh, 900 people were living there, and they were mostly from California. So we thought, well, they met us in the middle, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but they were told, they said, we're vegetarians. So there was 900 vegetarians. We today would call them vegans because um, they didn't eat meat or dairy products or eggs. And uh, the problem was, of course, no one heard of the word vegan in, back in 1975. You couldn't use it. It was just an unknown word. So they said, we're vegetarians. They had about uh, 200 children that were born on the farm that were basically vegan from birth, no meat, no dairy or eggs, and everybody was thriving. No one was dragging themselves through the bud, you know, mud, begging us for protein. You know. People were doing great. They were healthy. They were strong. They were very um, creative. They were doing all these different projects and things. So. Um, so I remember asking them, I said, so why are you guys doing this? Why are you vegetarians? And the guy I was talking to said, well, there's two main reasons. One is most of the food that we're growing, we're feeding to animals and people are starving. And, the, and, that, and that, that's not good. And so he said, we're eating lower on the food chain so there'll be enough for everyone to eat so we won't have so many wars, basically. So we'll have more peace in the world. And I thought, wow, that's so noble. And why doesn't, why doesn't everybody know about that? You know, why, doesn't, why, don't people, why didn't they teach us that in college? And then he said the second reason uh, that they were doing this, not eating animal food, he said it was because of what the animals go through. He said, do you know what the animals go through? And I remember saying, don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> but he did tell me a few things. You know, he kind of pulled the curtain back, like in The Wizard of Oz, when the, you know, he, Toto pulls the curtain back. And I, he told a little bit about the routine you know, mutilations, the poor animals, how they're banging their head against the bars, driven into insanity by just, they can't move their bodies. You can imagine you can't move your body. You're just stuck in a cage, and they're just driven into insanity. And so. I, I suddenly, it was like pulling the curtain back and I saw all this violence and terror and pain on, on millions of animals, you know, like every day. And, and when nobody talks about it. But the thing that was interesting was, I think that made it very powerful, was the fact that I was with 900 people that were eating a totally plant-based diet, right? And I was eating with them every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, meals of vegetables and grains and beans, lots of soybeans back then, you know, that was the beginning. But the whole idea was, uh, for me was that I, I could learn how to do this and I could see it was healthier they were doing you know and I could also see it was better for hungry people it was better for animals so that was it from that day actually 1975 which is now 45 years ago I have never eaten any meat in my life actually since that day and um, I heard when I met Madeline many years later um, I found out that she also in Switzerland as a young artist decided the same month and year uh, at the end of 1975, to never eat any meat in her life as well. So that was kind of cool. And then a few years later, I uh, ended up getting out to California and learning a little bit more about um, the abuse of animals uh, for dairy products and eggs. So I became a vegan in 1980. So that was now, like I say, 40 years ago. And I always say, it was the, besides marrying Madeline, it was the smartest thing I ever did. Moving to a plant-based way of eating really for, for our physical health and for internally and for everything, it's just a, it's a great gift we can give ourselves. It's like leaving a prison. You know, it's like you don't realize it. It's like having shoes on that are too tight your entire life, and, you, and so you don't even notice it after a while. So you, and, then, and then suddenly you take them off. It's like, woohoo! I can dance now. I feel so good. You know, it's like this wonderful release. But uh, the neat thing for me was for the second time in my life, a few years after that in 1984, 
um, I decided to become a Zen Buddhist monk. So I was living in meditation centers in California, like Buddhists, primarily Buddhists, like Zen. We're sitting a lot of Zen meditation, Tibetan Buddhists also. And so I went over to Korea, I shaved my head, I put on robes, I became a monk. I was living in a monastery in South Korea called Songgwangsa. And this monastery, I discovered when I was there, had been practicing what we would call veganism for almost 800 years, since the 1200s. In this community, no one ate any meat or dairy products or eggs or used any wool or silk or leather or fur. Even killing mosquitoes or other bugs, you try not to do it. The whole idea was to live a life of that word that was up there before, ahimsa, nonviolence. This is the core teaching of all the world religions. I used to teach college courses in comparative religion. Every religion, really, if you look deeply at the core of that religion, the main teaching is the same. The main teaching you could probably distill into one sentence, which would be, whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others, right? That basic idea, if I want to be loved, then to be loving. If I want to be free, then to help others be free. If I want to be abundant, then to be generous. You know, another way of saying it is, is, whatever you sow, so shall you reap. You know, whatever we put out comes back. I call it the boomerang effect. You know, whatever we put out comes back. This is, this is a basic universal teaching. When we hear this, something deep within us goes, yep, we know that's true because this is how the world works. So to just understand that animal agriculture essentially is doing to others what we would not want to have done to ourselves. No one would want to be imprisoned and impregnated and, and so forth. Oh, you got it. Thank yes. you. Wow, here we go. All right. <laughs> Good job. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right. So, we'll continue on. So, um, so that's, but that's basically what I wanted to say here um, this afternoon. These are, these are some of the main ideas. Uh, to just understand, really, how each one of us are raised into, in a community where, in many ways, um, it's not our fault. We're just eating the foods that we were taught to eat and, and by parents. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's nobody's fault. It just goes back, all the way back to Iraq, you know, th you know 10,000 years ago. But for whatever reason, those people thought they needed to do it. We don't need to do it anymore. And so now we can, we can make a change, a positive change in our own lives and also share these ideas with other people. So this is the key thing, I think, is to understand that psychologically, you know, internally, emotionally, animal agriculture, this is probably the final thing I'll say, and then I'll open up for questions. It's just that, as I said earlier, animal agriculture is the worst thing we're doing for the outer world, right, to our environment, to our culture, to our physical body, but also to our inner world. And the problem is that we're doing all, so many devastating things to the outer world. We have, really, we're very intelligent as human beings. I mean, we should be able to do better than we're doing. But we're using a lot of our money and resources to build bigger weapons, to cut down the rainforest faster, to destroy oceans. I mean, why are we doing that? The thing, the problem is animal agriculture. It, it gets into our brain, into our feelings, into our attitudes, and it's an attitude of domination and exploitation of others. And, and so it just creates an economic system, a political system, a religious system, an educational system, all the, uh, the same. They're all hurting. They're all based on domination and exploitation of the weak by the strong. So that makes it very difficult for us to solve the problems because of the, the attitude of animal agriculture, the attitude of imprisoning other beings and just seeing, buying and selling them by the pound. I mean, think of that. So this is these, these are a couple, I'll just give, in the World Peace Diet, I give maybe, I don't know, 10 different attitudes. I'll just give maybe two, three, maybe. One is the attitude of disconnectedness. The subtext of every meal, if I'm sitting there, like I did for years growing up eating the usual food, was don't make the connection. Don't think about where this food came from. If we're eating bacon, it's just bacon. Like when my mother said we're having bacon, I was always the first one there. <laughs> I loved bacon. There's all that fat and salt, and yum, 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 right? But I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. It was just bacon to me, bacon, yum, yum, yum. But if, I had, if my mother had said, well, this is the flesh of an animal who was imprisoned her entire life. She was killed and screaming and bleeding. I was like, oh, you know, can I have a banana? I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to eat it. <laughs> you know, we don't know what it is. So that's the, it's not our fault. You know, it's just, this is what happens. But this attitude of disconnectedness, and it's basically an attitude of staying shallow and not looking deeply, not caring deeply, not feeling deeply. 
and it makes us very easily manipulated and easily controlled and makes us easily exploited. You know, if we're eating animal foods, we're not only exploiting animals, we're being exploited. Anyone eating animal foods is being exploited. Over and over again, we take out our wallets, we pay to stab animals. And what happens? Sooner or later, we're on our back getting stabbed for a quadruple heart bypass surgery or for cancer or something else. So we don't need to stab other beings to be healthy. The best thing is to let them be healthy. So to understand, uh, to, be, uh, to move to a, what's called veganism or a plant-based way of eating is to make an effort to make connections, to just see the connections. That, and the interesting thing is the definition of intelligence is the capacity to make connections. So the more we practice this, the more we're going to stop eating animal foods and the more our natural intelligence and our emotional intelligence, our sensitivity will come back. So that's one attitude. Another one, of course, is the one I mentioned earlier of, of domination and exploitation, of commodification. Like, instead of seeing a being as a being, we see a being uh, like a commodity. We buy and sell them by the pound. This is extremely bizarre. I mean, I can't think of anything more bizarre than buying and selling beings by the pound. Uh, you know, this is like, like they're rocks. I mean, do you realize how dull we have to become as a society? How completely stupid, really, we have to become as a society to sell beings by the pound? Like they're just things. You realize how barbaric, how un unimaginative and brutal that is? I mean, if I, I can't even think. I mean, it's pure materialism. And this materialism insinuates itself into our entire educational system. So we're, we teach kids now that there's no meaning to life in the universe. It's just random mutation. And, that, and then all you can do to give any meaning to your life is to buy a lot of products. And, and uh, this, this is a way to enslave people. We enslave people, you enslave animals. The slavery goes together. So if we want to liberate ourselves, we have to liberate those we are enslaved. And the animals, when we liberate animals, then we'll be worthy of being free ourselves. And so that means to learn to look with eyes of, of respect at other expressions of life. Cows, pigs, and chickens, wildlife, hungry people, indigenous people, everyone with kindness and respect. To be inclusive, include all beings within the sphere of our kindness and compassion. When we do that, we open up the doorway for joy and healing and awakening to come into our world through us. You know, through us, we can help heal the world. Because what I'm doing, each one of us, is to do the best I can. I, there's no way I can change anybody else. You know, if I try to change anybody else, they would resist. And that's good. You should resist. <laughs> if someone came up to me and wanted to change me, I would fight back, you know. But I can't change anyone, but I can change myself. I can work on myself to bring my own life into alignment with an ex being an expression of kindness and respect and love. And I think all of us, if we work on it, do, do the best we can to do that ourselves, then we make it easier for others to do the same thing. And that's the best thing we can do, I think, is to help others by, by doing the best we can to question in our own minds the delusions that still live inside of us, the, the voices that are talking, uh, that are causing us to harm others. And when we do that, we begin to heal our, our community and heal our world. Uh, so, another th subtext basically is the subtext of privilege and elitism. Again, the, sub the, main, the main message in every meal is that certain beings are inherently superior, right? Other beings are inherently inferior, and it's totally fine for the superior beings to dominate and exploit and oppress the inferior beings. Every time we're eating animal foods, that's what we're, what we're learning and what we're teaching. You know, that, and then we say, well, we want to create a world of justice and equality. And we're eating this, we're eating a message of domination and exploitation of the weak by the strong. It's never gonna happen. We have more injustice and more inequality today probably than ever in many ways. We have a tiny wealthy elite. So the whole idea is, look, if we wanna have justice, then give justice to those who we're abusing. It's easy to blame, you know, the, uh, who, who do you wanna blame? You know, blame the president or blame you know, powerful people. But to really ourselves, live what we would like. Like Gandhi said, there'll never be any positive social change without positive personal change. We can change ourselves. The final one I mentioned earlier, and I'll just, I'll just reinforce it. Uh, I, I have a chapter in the World Peace Diet that's about Sophia. Sophia is the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. It's the feminine, sacred feminine dimension of consciousness. Women especially have this, this wisdom inside of us that learns to love and nurture and protect life, especially babies, right? children, to love and protect these you know, babies. Men also have this capacity to love and nurture life.
But animal agriculture is about suppressing Sophia. You don't, if you have people that have Sophia functioning, you won't have animal agriculture because you've got to impregnate them, you've got to steal their babies. You know, breaking the bond between the mother and her baby, that's like the most demonic thing you can do. Like as soon as a mother gives birth to a baby, she wants to love and nurse and protect that baby. If that's a baby cow or a pig or chicken, any animal, you steal the baby, kill the baby, impregnate her again, steal the baby, impregnate, kill her, impregnate her, steal the baby, and then kill the mother. I mean, this is demonic. It's the most horrific thing. But we do it over and over again by the millions every day, and it's in the background behind the curtain, and then somehow we think we can have a society of justice and peace and equality and freedom when we don't give it to those who would like it, right? As we sow, we reap. So the good news is, that as we respect the sacred feminine and the mothers uh, who would like to love their babies, then we create a foundation for healthy relationships in our world. And this is something we can all contribute to because these animals, I mean, we, Madeline and I living in an RV, sometimes we would park our RV near a dairy and all night, three or four, five o'clock in the morning, we can hear the dairy cows bellowing and crying because their babies have been stolen. So we don't want to contribute to that. So I think this is the basic idea. And I'll just close with this, um, with this thought that um, if we're, we live in a wonderful time. Right now, today, we live in a time when we're having a, a really fantastic awakening of consciousness on this earth. I know there's certainly lots of problems, but there's, we see it, Madeline and I, when we're traveling all over the world, we go travel to Africa, to the Middle East, to Europe, to South America, to Asia, to Australia, New Zealand, and everywhere we go, we can see that people are really beginning to question animal agriculture and realize that we can thrive on a fraction of the resources, we can allow animals to be free, and we can be much healthier and happier. And it seems like a little thing, just becoming like a vegan or moving to a plant-based way of eating for ethical reasons, but it's actually a big thing. It's probably the most powerful statement anyone can make for, for creating healing and love in our society today because it goes right to the root of the problem which is this massive system of domination and exploitation of other animals that's hidden and that is very uh, much a part of our cultural, uh, sort of it's, it's, inter it's interwoven with everything in our society. So when we question that, it's not that easy actually, but when we do that and we actually bring our lives into alignment with our values, we create a field of joy and justice and health that will bless not only ourselves, but blesses everyone. So I want to just thank all of you. I know if you're here, if you found your way here, and if you're still here after I said all that, you know, <laughs> you're, pe you're people who uh, have caring hearts, and I think that's what puts us all on the same page. We have a, we care uh, for others, and that basic caring, I think, is really the foundation of creating a society of peace and freedom for all of us in the future. So much love to all of you, and thanks again for all the efforts that you're making. Thank you. Thank you very much.